This is Kristen O'Brien, Managing Editor at NFX, and you're listening to the NFX Podcast. Today, we're talking with Stacey Brown, Philpot, and Pete Flint about what it takes to lead a marketplace startup. Stacey is the CEO of TaskRabbit, the company that invented the gig economy. TaskRabbit is a leading marketplace for home services and errands. They were acquired by IKEA in 2017, and they're now available in six countries. Let's jump in. So it's a real pleasure today to have Stacey Brown Philpot, the CEO of TaskRabbit, who is also a dear old friend. Um, so thank you for joining us today on the NFX podcast. Thank you for having me, Pete. Nice to see you. So I'd love to just kick off. And if you think about in 2020, the technologies and the startup ecosystem since those days has exploded. I mean, startups and seed funds, it's like exploding. So it's almost on the one hand, it's easier than ever to be a, a founder and start a company and CEO. But at the same time, you know, perhaps it's harder than ever to be a great leader. Can you can you share a little bit about how you think about leadership? And, you know, is there a crisis today in in technology leadership and what can we do about it? What does it mean to be a leader in today's times is a really hard question to answer because it's evolving. I would say in the past, people would say, if you become a CEO of a publicly traded company, then your number one priority is your shareholders. If you become you know, a founder of a company and you get investors, then your priority is to deliver the value that you said the investors want. And if you create a business and people buy it, you get a return. And that's like no longer the case anymore. The expectations, I wake up and I think about not just how much value we're creating in terms of revenue and profitability, but also the team that we're building. We have to not just have a mission, but live that mission every day. We have to focus on the culture. We have to talk about the culture. And then we have to look at the external environment and be able to respond to the culture. Outside of TaskRabbit, there's a lot happening, a lot in terms of the treatment of women. As a woman who's a founder, I have to come in and have a point of view and maybe not always have the right answer, but create an environment that's inclusive and people can hear it. As the political environment changes, people are asking me, what should TaskRabbit respond to in these situations? And that never used to be part of the dialogue anymore. It was always very separate. And so I wouldn't call it a crisis of leadership. I would just say that what's expected of a leader today goes way beyond just profits and profitability and, and and extends into how you treat people, what kind of person you are, and how you lead, and not just what you do. For you as a leader, perhaps I'm curious, you know, you've done a whole bunch of different things throughout your career. What Was there a particular leadership challenge that you, that was incredibly sort of challenging, and, and perhaps share kind of how, what was that challenge, and, and how did you get through that? We had a data breach um, two years ago. And it was almost two years ago at this point. Um, and our site went down. And um, we had to come together as a team to really figure out what we were going to do. And obviously, a lot of the work was going into getting the site back up, figuring out what data, if any, was compromised, making sure that um, the people who worked at the company employees were taken care of. And of course, we were thinking about our taskers. Tasks had to be done. Clients were depending on TaskRabbit for somebody to show up and the app wasn't up and it wasn't, it wasn't running. And so we scrambled as an operations team to pull all these things together. We got the crisis response team to manage through it. And one of the things that we were debating was how do we handle it if a tasker can't show up for their job because they can't find out where the client is that day? Um, do we compensate them for that day or do we not? And there was this moment where we were trying to do the analysis, but we couldn't do the analysis in enough time that we had to do the press release. And I said, forget about the analysis. Let's just pay everybody for the next two days. Like if you were going to do a task, we're going to figure out what you probably would have earned on that task. And we're just going to pay the taskers because it's the right thing to do. And so sometimes you just don't have you're in a crisis and you just don't know what the right thing to do is. And in this case, that was the right thing to do because then we told all our taskers that was gonna happen. You know what they started doing? They started going on Facebook to find their client. They started figuring out, oh, did I have this person's phone number? Can I text them and see if I can still show up? And many of them like went 
out of their way to get the task done, even though the site was down and we didn't even see a dip at all in our growth or our revenues because of that outage. Kind of walk us through sort of the how you figured out what the right thing to do is. Who do you rely on in times of crisis to help you navigate? We are a very tight team. And so it was my core leadership team that came together and there was some decisions that our general counsel could just make by herself. And there was some decisions that we all had to make as a team. And this was one of them. So we had my VP of ops, we had my general counsel and we had the team there. The other thing that I did is we had advisors. We had some great advisors who do crisis management. And then I contacted a couple of people who'd gone through this before. And so I have great people in my life who've seen many things that I have yet to see. And I'm excited to learn what those things are. This is not one that I planned for. But when it happened, I had a couple of people who'd gone through it before reach out to me and said, hey, if you ever need help like around this, like let me know. And I remember texting one person and said, hey, we're, we're trying to decide what we're going to do here. He said, here's how I would think about it. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, it came down to our values. Our number one value is caring deeply. And that value was more important than anything else that we were dealing with at the moment. And we care deeply about our taskers. So he said, if that's the value, fine, we just pay everybody. Out of that experience, was there anything that you changed sort of fundamentally from the kind of from the company or yourself or the things that you learned just going through that? I have two things. So, you know, one of them is one of my favorite quotes is by Dr. Martin Luther King, which is the ultimate measure of a man or a woman in today's time is not how he stands in times of convenience, but how he stands in times of challenge and controversy. And we had yet to have something controversial happen. And this was it. And it really was a test of what kind of team have I built? Like, is this the kind of team that's going to stand together? And we completely did. So it was a good learning about the importance of building a team of people who are going to be there with you and through that time of challenge and controversy. Yeah, that resonates with me in in the time of when I was running Trulia, the 2008, during Lehman collapse. It was like, (laughs) then you're in, in the real estate, you're in an online real estate company, the Financial markets collapse, real estate collapses, and you, you know, we were about three years old then, and so, but the, but it was just a torturous time. You just, yeah. you do not know what to do. But for having built a foundation of a strong culture and values, then people figure it out. You know, there's a, there's a kind of obviously they need clear leadership, but I think the culture is one of those things that certain company and values is, is one of those things that certain companies leave too late. Yes, um, and they kind of try to add it in when they need it and it's it's too late not authentic and it's far too late but if if you're able to sort of infuse a really strong culture from the outset then you have no idea what crisis but there's going to be a crisis and that will kind of you know you'll be thankful that the infrastructure is there and that culture that will, will able you to carry carry through that were there any experiences which you had to as a company just get through a certain kind of constraint or challenge that kind of unlock some value you know as you think about scaling the business off you know whether I think Ben Horowitz calls it the struggle in that early scaling period were there any stories about okay there was this kind of this hack or this idea or this um, insight which enabled the company to perhaps scale where it is today you know when I joined TaskRabbit we were sort of known for oh this is going to be the next eBay for services it's auction model people bid people ask and it sort of matches And we were in nine cities, and it was going fine. The problem that we had is our fulfillment rate, which if you all are running marketplaces, you know exactly what I'm talking about, was like 50%. And so any investor would look at that and say, (laughs) I'm never going to put another dollar in because that's just awful. Uh, We just couldn't figure out how to move that number. And the struggle, as you mentioned, was like we tried everything. We were trying to like convince people to like – set different prices. We were trying to convince clients to pick certain categories and you just couldn't convince people. Ultimately, we had to change the product. And when we changed the product to a direct hire model where we listed all the taskers who were available with their hourly rates and you know what their skills are, and then you just go in and hire the person, it was like fulfillment rate went up, skyrocketed, It was successful, but we had to go through that and like tweak and iterate and really try really, really hard to figure out like this thing is not going to work. We actually have to tell people 
who's available to do what, and how much it's going to cost. Otherwise, we're never going to get our fulfillment where it needs to be. So this is a demand side pick. Correct. So to, to, so, and then before, what was it? It was opaque? It was, it was um, demand side still pick, but you just bid. You know, I want to get my house clean. Okay. 25 people bid, and you go back if you want to and pick, ah. but they bid different prices. The problem with that, you pick somebody for $10, you're unhappy. You pick somebody for $100, and they still don't do a good job, you're unhappy. You pick somebody for $50, you think is amazing, but they oh, but you know what? I'm not available on the day that you want. Then you're still unhappy. Yeah. So you just couldn't make people happy with an auction model. So that, and that reduced that friction, so enabled the matching rate to go up. So it went from 50 to something. Like close to 90%. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Way better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so much better. You have a business. So that was the core pricing change. And what was the reaction from the participants in the ecosystem? Obviously, on the demand side, I think they were probably much happier. On the supply side, similarly, it was like, okay, I get what the company's about. I can easily fulfill orders. The supply side was delighted as well. Yeah. So we, we launched this as a test in London where no one knew anything about TaskRabbit. So when we launched it, super successful. Taskers knew how much they were going to make. People could hire. The person showed up. Everybody was happy. And then we brought it back to the U.S. And when we did that, everyone's going to be equally as happy, right? Wrong. But what we had built was a community that had come accustomed to a certain way of working and behavior. And so our taskers were worried that if I put myself out there and put my calendar, how do I know I'm gonna get hired? I used to have so much more agency, I could bid, and now I can't bid, I'm just waiting for somebody to hire me. I don't trust you. There was a trust issue. So they had to believe in us that the work was going to come. Likewise, clients like to pick from 25 people who is TaskRabbit to decide who the best person is. How are we gonna know? How do I trust you? So it really pushed us to create a higher level of trust. And initially, the trust was not there. So we had to rebuild that trust for sure. So that took like three, six months to figure out that? Less than six months. Okay. We had a, and the reason why I said that answer so fast of how long that took is because we were watching what happened to our revenues over a six month period. And they needed to reach a certain level for us to know mm -hmm. if that was the right decision or not. And we did. But it's, it's, I mean, one of the sort of classic, I mean, as you see in the market, marketplace businesses are incredibly dynamic. You've seen how an existing business model is incredibly hard to change. And one of the wonderful things about marketplaces is they're incredibly sticky. But one of the challenges is the participants really hate change. So you see people like Craigslist, which just don't change, but kind of do okay. Yes. Increasingly less okay, but they do okay. But and then you've seen other other businesses which are constantly innovating, evolving, and Amazon has perhaps been kind of pioneering its incremental changes over time. If you were to perhaps do that again and and change the change perhaps the pricing model or business model within a marketplace, what what changes would you do? How would you do it differently? Or, or alternatively, what was the what was the best thing you did with that change? There was there's a lot that we would have done differently. Um, one of we would have we would have chosen that business model, but we probably would have done a lot more communication about what was about to happen. We thought we'd do this great press release and tell everybody, and they're going to be happy. And the truth is, is we should have brought the community along because it's such a sticky marketplace. People are so invested. We didn't tell our taskers until the day before it was happening. We should have introduced the concept to them. We should have got them involved. We should have encouraged them to participate in the development process. And those are all things we could have done. Even if we ended up with the same decision on the same timeline, we would have brought people along. And that's a unique thing about marketplaces that many other companies don't have to worry about. But the importance of the community and how you interact with them was a huge piece of what we would have done differently, for sure. As the marketplace ecosystem has evolved, there's been this sort of tension between horizontal mar marketplaces or increasing, increasingly verticalization. How do you think about you know this balance between horizontal versus vertical? That is a tough balance. When we started, we were everything. And so because we were everything, we were nothing to somebody and everything to everybody. Since then, we've actually focused and become a lot more vertical, focusing specifically on home services. So a task management network that gives you trusted people to do things around your home. It's a much easier message to communicate. 
And so while we haven't specifically said only TV mounting or only furniture assembly, even though we're owned by IKEA or only cleaning, we have put in some boundaries of what we will offer and what we will do and what we won't. And the reason is adjacencies. I think it's important to have some adjacencies in a marketplace because a customer comes to you, you spend all that money and all that time to build trust. And now they're like, they want to come to you for something else. So you've got to look at what are the adjacencies. And so we built our marketplace around what adjacencies actually matter for our target customer. And it tends to be things around the home. And that adjacency is not only important, I guess, to increase the revenue per customer, but also to increase the sort of repeat value, Correct. Repeat, repeat interactions. The more people use this as a kind of like the habit, this is my go-to, then that increases frequency, increases brand, increases retention. That's right. It's all about being this go-to team. And so you have to have enough frequency and presence in their mind and in their home for that to really work. With services marketplace, one of the big challenges have been disintermediation. How do you go kind of like off platform, you know, with the sort of home care marketplaces, it's been a real challenge. What do you do to, to overcome that challenge of transactions happening off platform? Disintermediation is hard to manage. And, I, you know, we spend a lot of time figuring out how to keep people on the platform. And sometimes get something to come to you, you have to actually just let go. So we said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to build the best marketplace that we can. We're going to attract amazing clients who are who have a lot of demand. And we're going to give our taskers the best opportunities for work that they can find. They can set their own hourly rates. They can set their own schedule. And you know what? We're going to back them up. If something goes wrong, we're going to be there for them. And that's the kind of thing we want to build. And so we built that. And so we've been able to manage this intermediation because you now have a place that you can go where you now trust this platform to do things for you that you might not otherwise choose to do on your own or to validate things and uncertainties that you might have about using the experience. And that's how we've done it. I, I have yet to find another company who does anything that prevents anybody from just leaving the marketplace. And we do have success stories. And I like to call a lot of them success stories where people will find a full-time job because they went and did a tad, they bartended somewhere, this this startup was hiring, and they got a job. So doing engineering or some other thing, that's great, right? That's exactly what this community is about. If we're not growing the community that we're a part of, we're not doing something more than we that we thought we were here to, to do. And, and is that, I guess it's also a function of the rake as well? What is the kind of pricing? If you're, if you try to sort of, if you, if you try to kind of like charge too much, as a marketplace and that creates problems. If you charge too little, then there's like, it's hard to build a sustainable <laughs> business and yes. attract supply and demand. It's like, is that, you know, if you were to, if you think about that kind of evolution of that decision, has there been kind of any insights that you've learned over the evolution of TaskRabbit in terms of pricing and other other than just fixed price? Yeah, the, the, the take rate or rake or however you want to describe it is this weird thing because you can do the bottoms up version, which is like, here's our cost. <laughs> here's how much we need to cover the cost. This is what it needs to be. And then you can do the outside in version, which is how much are people willing to pay for this service? And then how much can we make? We have really tried to focus on letting our taskers set their own hourly rates. And we don't mess with that number at all. So if you want to charge $150 an hour, that's your decision. And then we've looked at what does it take to build a great marketplace? How much do we need to charge? That prices some people out and it does, but then we educate them on, well, if this is how much you want to make in a week, this is how many tasks you can do at a lower hourly rate, for example. So we try, we do a lot of education around the rate, but because we let them set their own hourly rates, that's the best thing that we do because we're not taking money out of the tasker's pocket. Yeah. We may be charging more to the clients, but it equalizes to some degree the experience on the marketplace because the client still has a choice on who she wants to hire mm -hmm. at a higher or a lower hourly rate. And you, are you, and just as you think about the task rabbit specifically, demand versus supply constraint, like mm -hmm. what's how is that? And we'll go into sort of geographic expansion. Like, how, how do you think about, are you supply constrained, demand constrained um, 
in general? And then how do you think about your geographic expansion? What are the kind of gating factors for you to go into to go into different markets? Because it seems to me that many other competitors have just gone out of business because they've either grown too fast in too different too many different markets. Or there's been, they haven't attracted enough demand or the demand's not sticky enough. So TaskRap and Out operates in six countries and each country, including the U.S., is very different. Uh, we've gone through the cycles of being demand constrained and supply constrained in almost all of them. We just launched Spain last month, so that one's still very new. We have a lot of supply because we always start with a lot of supply and enough to meet what we think the demand is going to be unless we're way, way off. And by and large, investing in not just the quantity of supply, but the quality of supply has been the most important thing to balance the two-sided marketplace. So even when we get demand constrained, we still got a great supply. And when we're supply constrained, we can really work with that community and say, hey, things are happening. It's the end of the month. It's New York. People are moving, it's the summer, and nobody wants to do it themselves. So if you want to earn some extra money, like this is the time to do it. So we've got that relationship there to manage some of the spikes in demand while we build up the supply that we need over time. Every country is different. We went into Canada thinking this was going to be a slam dunk, and we turned out to be way more supply constrained than we thought. And part of that has been working with Ikea as a partner. So after the UK, we launched in Canada, that was the first country we launched with Ikea. And some of our criteria is how, how big is the market? What's the potential? What does demand look like? Readiness for this kind of work, independent contractors. But it's also, where does Ikea operate? How can they really support our growth? And it turned out that the team in Canada really unlocked a lot of growth for us that we just did not anticipate. It was exciting because we can now go meet that challenge, but it, it created a new dynamic for us in how we scale in a new country for sure. And is there is there any frameworks or like, as you think about geographic expansion, is there any, you know, both sequencing different regions as well as timing? Are we ready to expand into another market? As, as you speak to other marketplace founders and CEOs, like are there any rules of thumb that you develop to help to understand this geographic expansion? So one rule of thumb is not to even think about it in regions got to think about it not even at the country level at the city level make the city meaning people say make the market make the market the city have enough demand in that city where geographically speaking the people who are doing the work for us are willing to drive as far as that city is you know big to go and do the work and so really focus on making the market and making the city we launched in london in one store for Ikea in the Wembley store. And we didn't like go to the next store until we figured out that that store was a good store. It's a neighborhood, not even cities, just neighborhoods. a neighborhood. Yep. It's neighborhoods. And then we didn't launch more cities across the UK for a long time after we did London because we were looking at the numbers and the potential. We weren't yet big enough to do enough brand marketing to cover the country it was not going to pay off. And some of these smaller cities are so small that you're just not going to generate enough demand from those. And so the big cities really make the neighborhood. But for the smaller cities, make sure you have enough coverage to afford the marketing around them. So Task Rabbit is a division of IKEA now? Yes. Yep. How did, and like, how did that, like, how did you get to know the IKEA folks? That's, I mean, it's, um, it's amazing kind of partnership. I'd love to, how do you get to know them? This is going to sound like one of those Silicon Valley stories, and maybe it is. But in December of 2015, the IKEA team came to visit Silicon Valley and met a bunch of companies, including TaskRabbit. There were like 10 people in the room around a table that was not an IKEA table, which they commented on the minute they walked in uh, at our office. And we now have IKEA tables, by the way. And... And we thought it was a great meeting. But one of the most important things we shared with them in that meeting was how many people pay somebody else to get their furniture assembled. And on average, how much they pay, which is often as much or very a little bit less than the cost of the item. And so with that information, and, they, and we didn't even have a relationship with them. We were just like, just so you know, lots of people go to Emeryville store and... 
They then they log into TaskRabbit and they hire somebody to come put it together. So that became the conversation around I've the partnership. That. You've done that. I've done that. It's yes. Exactly. That was my first use case. Of course. Yeah. Lots of people have, and that started the partnership. And from there, we really focused a lot on what value were we going to create. We obviously were creating value for customers who wouldn't otherwise shop at IKEA. The only reason why they went is because they know somebody from TaskRabbit is going to put that thing together for them. But the company is very values driven. And so to go from a partnership to an acquisition was not just about how much money we were making for them or for ourselves. It was also about what kind of value we were creating and our own values as a company and the alignment of those values. So a lot of the diligence was hours on values Mm -hmm. and what matters and what kind of company are we building and why and how can we really do that together and and just how do you manage the culture because you've shared with me privately just the the values and is really impressive in the organization and it's and it's a remarkable company how how do you effectively navigate this sort of fast moving fast charging like we're a tech driven company in silicon valley and and we move 100 miles an hour because that's what's required and that's in our dna versus a you know a, a european furniture maker it's yes. like nine, nine <laughs> you make it seem so different Pete. <laughs> <laughs> it is very different but the missions are very similar so our mission at TaskRabbit is to make everyday life easier for everyday people ikea is to create a better everyday life for the many people ours was written 11 years ago there's 76. so because that mission alignment was there We could then, there's some forgiveness that happens on both sides, which is like, there's this greater mission that we all sort of care about how we get there. We really have been left independent to do that. We're technically a separate legal entity. We have a board that governs the company and they really didn't want to, what they say, squash the butterfly and like, let's just let this company run independently. So part of it is that decision as part of doing the deal. The second thing that we did was right after we announced the deal, we announced in October of 2017 and then in January of 2018, we redid our values. And not that we didn't have great values before, but it was a a moment and an opportunity for us to create new values if we wanted to, or keep reinforce the same values, but to establish that this is still going to be a separate entity. We're still going to have our values. And these are the values that are going to carry us through this next phase for this organization that'll also be around in 75 years. And what and just can you through that period, what's been some of the kind of growth in in geographies or any metrics, just like from the acquisition to where you are today? Yeah, we have seen so much growth. So we went from two countries to six countries. We, um, let's see, when we first met with IKEA and started this partnership, our business was about 2% furniture assembly, and now it's 20% furniture assembly. So it's it's still the vast minority. It's it's a vast minority, but, and so it's fueled a lot of our growth. The business is still growing. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the customer acquisition from IKEA is, is also growing. And many of these customers are getting something assembled and then coming back. Yeah. and getting something mounted or some other service done. So that's been impressive. I I was, Ikea is the world's largest furniture retailer. And so imagine having that customer base to tap into. It's the one thing we were hoping for, and it's really paid off. And, and if there was, you know, because it is really unusual that, you know, this sort of big traditional company and this fast moving tech company, it's hard for them sometimes to work together in this in this environment. Is there any, what would have perhaps have been some of the biggest surprises of yeah. the experience? And then, and then what advice would you give, you know, founders that are building high tech companies who are kind of building either partnerships or M&A with, with other perhaps more traditional companies? So one of the biggest surprises is to be the world's largest furniture retailer, you have to be a good business. The business has to be good and has to be well run. Otherwise, you're out of business. But the process by which companies make decisions is often very different. And so we've got the DNA here of this is the pace. It's really fast. Let's just go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's raise the next round of funny. And now we're going to be successful. And they're just very patient. They have like 40 billion euros on the balance sheet. Like they can just 
wait yeah. and they can test and they can iterate and so their process of innovation maybe doesn't happen as fast but they have the capital to invest and they have the time to invest and so we had to both get comfortable with how the pace of decision making for sure so if you're at all considering a partnership or potential m a with a more traditional company number one the pace is not is probably not going to be as fast as you want it to be number two often those things align with the strategy of which you have very little influence over. Meaning, if that company has a strategy that fits with what you're doing, then it's gonna be very easy for you to get that deal done. If you're trying to sell in your strategy into a company that's 20,000 people, that's exhausting. And so think about where else you should be spending your time. If this is your number one bet, and for us, IKEA was the company you're like, if we could partner with anybody, we'd love to. Mm -hmm. Make sure you set aside some resources, but not all the company resources to, to do it and to focus on it. So trying to create this sort of nimble team of uh, Navy SEALs kind of running a million miles an hour, but kind of working with the mothership, but not necessarily um, letting them to take the strategy. So it's been, you know, it feels to me like Task Rabbit kind of invented this sort of word gig economy. And it's remarkable, like it's it's pioneer in the category way before kind of Uber and Lyft, I think, in terms of kind of the impact on that economy. But a huge amount has changed as that kind of that segment of the market has expanded. Tell me a little bit about kind of what what's happening on regulation side and how TaskRabbit thinks about it. You've got AB5 and various kind of measures, you know, in flux. What, what is the right thing for the industry? Um, to help kind of all participants in the ecosystem, as well as kind of what do you think is right for Task Rabbit? Yeah, you know, Leah deciding to start this company 11 years ago, I don't think she went in thinking, I'm going to create the gig economy or the sharing economy, but she just wanted to have neighbors helping neighbors. And it turned into a phenomenon that the world was actually ready for. It was 2008, and people were ready for something different. They needed a way to afford to live. Today, people need a way to afford to live. And more and more people need a way to afford to live. And so whatever regulation that has been passed or is currently in the process of being passed is really, I believe, in service of that. But the process is different than how many of the companies in our space are approaching it. So what matters for the industry and for the sharing economy or gig economy is that we create a way for people to afford to live. We are creating economic opportunities. We are filling the income gap. We are helping people pay major, major bills. We are doing a lot of the things that a lot of people say they want to do. It is actually happening because of the companies that we have. And for TaskRabbit, we want nothing more for them for that to continue. We want to continue to offer our taskers flexibility to set their own hourly rates. We want them to have the option to set their hours for when they want to work. And we, but we also want them to have benefits. We are not against portable benefits. We wanna create a structure where that is supported and available to them. And so those are the things that we're advocating for as we navigate some of the regulatory environment. And is there, I mean, if there was, is there a holy grail out there? Like what would be the, if, if you were uh, kind of writing these bills, like what would you advocate for? I wish there were a holy grail. It is so complicated because when we have these conversations, everybody has something else in mind about what's important for the group. When we talk to our taskers, they want to be able to save for retirement, like access to a 401k. They obviously want great health care. Some of them want workers' compensation, but most of them don't because a lot of them are supplementing their income and they have a job already that provides that. So we would love to be able to offer some way to afford the things that they need when they need it. I don't know what that looks like mm -hmm. because we don't have a structure today anywhere. W-2 does not allow for that structure. We don't have a structure today anywhere that and, and allows for that. And there's no other international market which um, you've seen that kind of does a good job in navigating this? Some Six, of these socialist European countries, no? Six countries and nothing. We nothing. found nothing, <laughs> no. Um, it's an, every country has a point of view around independent contractors that some of them whom are different than in the US. Some of them are more accepting, some are more stringent. And so we're having to deal with that as well. You know, here we are in the midst of the corona crisis. What do you think about that? I'm sure you've had conversations with your team. You know, there's sort of, on the one hand, there's clearly a travel industry. Is it going to be 
really challenged. On the other hand, there's sort of at least speculation that there'll be certain industries. Uh, as I saw this morning that Grubhub was upgraded as a stock because people were going to be like, you know, using, their delivery, DoorDash, services. using their delivery <laughs> services at DoorDash. And maybe it's too early to tell, but like, how do you think that might if, might impact not only just TaskRabbit, but perhaps kind of this broader ecosystem of the gig economy or shared economy? I, I think it's a little bit too early to, to call any particular company, obviously certain industries. Where do I think TaskRabbit fits in this? The most important thing that we care about is the safety of our employees and the community, our taskers and our clients. And so we focused on what communications do we need to do to make sure that they are protected at this time. Many of them have to go to work. And so we, but we want them to be safe. So we've said things like, if you have to cancel because you're not feeling well, then we'll waive the cancellation fee. Something like that. Something where they feel like they might be penalized for something, but they won't be. I think over time, the dependency that we have on services is actually going to go up because now we the things that we used to do ourselves, we're going to start looking around and figuring out who can do them for us. And that may create some value. It may create some, or it may be scary to people. But if it becomes more of a norm, then I think for anybody who's running a marketplace for any kind of service has an opportunity to demonstrate what kind of value you can create. So we're just trying to be as safe as possible during this time so people can see that this is a valuable service, whether you're in a crisis or not. But it seems that there will be some sort of lasting impact from this. And what we've, what we've seen in so many, when, when you have these economic shocks or shocks of any kind, then yes. it's, there's a mismatch between supply and demand. Yes. And so... And it's the smart, nimble marketplaces that can identify these mismatches of supply and demand that can capture a market share and then ex- use that as a wedge to expand it to other markets. So boy, I'm just hopeful it will it will pass pretty soon and we can move move back on with what we we're doing before. Yeah, I hope so too. So thanks again, Stacey. This is an amazing conversation and uh, such a wonderful story and such a wonderful leader. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me.